Good morning again, Emmanuel Church. Thank you for being here today. Uh, let us pray and ask God for his blessing and favor and his mind that we may understand what God is showing us today. So let's bow in word. Father, again, we come before you thanking you and praising you. What a what a blessed God you are. What a righteous, holy God you are in your provision and care and concern for us. We pray for those that are not here today, Lord, that you would bless them and find favor over them and help them return to us to worship and praise you with us together. We pray to God that uh, you will protect those that are on vacation and that those that are going through some trials and tribulations in their lives and illnesses. We thank you, dear God, that you're always with us. And no matter what you allow to come into our lives, you are there to make the best of it for us. To turn any evil, to any, turn any trouble, tribulation into good. And so, Lord, we surrender and submit to your goodness. And so, Father, we, we ask that you open up our hearts and minds that we may see more of you today and that you would help us uh, serve you with greater excitement, greater enthusiasm, and greater strength and power by your Holy Spirit. Because we pray this and ask this in the powerful name, the righteous name, the strong name, the defending name, the glorious name. Whose name, church? In Jesus' name. And we pray for our internet family and friends that they too would bow before you and have complete and total surrender to you that, that we will all allow you to work in and through our lives in a most powerful way. Again, because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we talked about is everything that God causes or allows to happen, is it good? Is it? Why is there so much evil in the world? Where does the evil come from? Why does Yahweh God allow it? Does all this evil have a purpose? And what is that purpose if evil does have a purpose? Well, in Isaiah 45, 6 through 8, it sums it up quite well. It says, that they may know from the rising of the sun to the setting that there is what? None, no one. None beside me. Right, you both right. None beside God. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I create displeasure, misery, sorrow, trouble, great grief, evil. I, the Lord, do what? All these things. And then he says this. And he does all these things. He allows all these things. He does all these things to rain down you heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. God does and allows evil and trials and tribulations so that he can pour down righteousness. Let the earth open. Let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together with salvation. I, the Lord, have created it. Amen? Yahweh God, <clears throat> excuse me, is in total control of what happens on the earth in everyone's lives. And that means the saved and the lost. He is not evil. He is good. He is a good God and he turns evil that is in mankind's heart and works it, it all out for, for good. He works it all out for the good of his creation, including the seemingly bad, evil things. Psalms, 1, Psalms 19 says, and I don't know why this is cutting out. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's flawless. It's been tried and tested. 
It's restoring and refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are reliable and they're trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Everything that God does is righteous and holy, bringing joy to the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's enduring. It's enduring forever. And here it is. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are always righteous. Everything God does and allows is good because his motives. Here it is. His motives and intents are to restore his creation, his human creation, to his perfect status in the kingdom of heaven. Yahweh God must he must judge evil and destroy it along with people who will not repent and follow his perfect commands. We will, what will we do? Will you and I follow God's commands explicitly, exactly, precisely? If we are to follow his commands, we must then know his word. We must be in his word every day. Obey it and be in fellowship with his people in his church, which is becoming his kingdom on earth. So every disaster, every good thing God does is to bring the lost of salvation, the saved, to a closer walk with him and to judge and banish all evil for eternity. Yes, God is good all the time in what he does and what he allows because he turns whatever evil mankind does into his righteousness or he judges evil and destroys it. So internet family and friends, I pray that you will bow before the Lord and trust him knowing that all that you face, God has allowed to bring you to a closer walk with him if you're saved, if you're not saved, to be saved and then to judge evil and sin. So, Today's message is, is God your buckler? Is God your shield? Is he your strong tower? Is he your fortress? Is he, is he your sword? Psalm 91.4 says, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his what? Thank you, Pastor Ray. His wings, you shall take refuge. Anybody been under the wings of the Lord this week? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yes. Amen. His truth, here it is, his truth shall be your shield and your buckler. Now, a buckler, what is a buckler? A buckler is a small shield worn on the wrist or the forearm during hand-to-hand -hand combat. Do we need uh, a buckler because we're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat? Yes, <laughs> we'll find out. Now, a regular shield is very large to protect against spears and arrows. And here is a picture. The picture on the left, the small little round shield, is a buckler. That's for hand-to-hand -hand combat. We need that. And then the large shield is like what they're, it's like almost like a uh, armored car, right? With the shield and the, the soldiers walking underneath and in, uh, underneath uh, and behind the shields. That is the shield. So God's word of truth is our buckler and our shield. God's truth is our very protection and our shield to shield us from evil and evil, lustful, immoral, and worldly agenda of corruption. In Deuteronomy 32, 11, it says, Like an eagle that rouses her chicks and hovers over her young, so he spread his wings to take them up and carry them up safely on his wings. Amen. In the next PowerPoint screen, you can see an image of God's wings formed in the clouds. Isn't that amazing? He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall find refuge. In Isaiah 40, 28, it says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, 
The creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is what? Weary. Weary. Isn't that amazing? God never, never, ever, 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 never gets tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and grow weary and young men shall utterly fall. But those who what? Who wait. Those who wrap their lives around and in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his word, surrender to his spirit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. The next is an image of a bird, or it's an image. It's an image of a butterfly, but it's a story of a bird caught in a fire in Yellowstone National Park. Um, Wow, I can't read it. (laughs) Honey, can you read it? Um, It's two small letters. I forgot all about that. But here's the story of, of what happened at that fire at Yellowstone National Park. After the forest, after a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park, forest rangers began their trek up a mountain to assess the inferno's damage. One ranger found a bird literally petrified in ashes, perched statuesquely on the ground at the base of a tree. Somewhat sickened by the eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. Then he gently struck him. Three tiny chicks scurried from under their dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings, instinctively knowing that the to- toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown to safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. When the blaze had arrived and the heat had scorched her small body, the mother had remained steadfast because she had been willing to die. So those under the cover of her wings were there. Is that an amazing story? He will cover you with his feathers. So where and why did this little bird get the inspiration and the motivation to do this for her baby chicks? Of course, the answer is absolutely from the Lord our God. To wait on the Lord is to seek and trust God's perspective in every circumstance of our lives to put ourselves under the protection of his wings. Let him be our buckler and our shield. This is why God wants us to totally obey him and his word so he can protect us from evil, the evil of Satan, the evil of the world, and the evil of our own flesh. Internet family and friends, I pray that you will take this to heart and, and really allow God to be your buckler, your, your shield, and, and, and be gathered under the power and strength of his wings. In, in Psalm 28, 7, it says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my what? Thank you, Stacy. My heart trusts. We have to trust God more than we trust our own feelings. We have to trust God more than we trust our own intellect because he knows all things. We often forget that we have very little strength in our flesh. That is why we we need to deny our flesh so that we can grasp onto Yahweh God's strength and his shield, his wisdom, his knowledge, his um, all-knowing power. In Psalm 33, 20, it says, Our soul waits for the Lord, for he is our help and... Thank you, Brother Fred. Shield. Whether we realize it or not, our souls are always longing for intimate connection with our Yahweh God. However, we erroneously look to the world for answers to this longing only to find lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which are not of the Father and can never satisfy the longing of our souls for the intimacy with our Creator God. In Psalm 32, 7, it says, You are my hiding place. 
You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my Thank you, Brother Fred. My eye. My eyes. Yes. It goes on to say, Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy, mercy shall sur surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. In other words, trusting God, believing in him, following his plan for, hit for our lives. Amen. The greatest joy, brothers and sisters, Internet family and friends, the greatest joy and excitement of a human soul is, in that, is an intimate, right relationship with the Lord our God. Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, you know, that is going to happen. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains, what? Shake. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Shake with its swelling. We need not fear because God is our refuge and strength. No matter how dangerous your environment is, the safest place to be is in God's righteous holy will, doing what he has called you to do. Amen? Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on... Thank you, Stacy. You trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. The Lord is my rock and my fortress in 18, Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my what? Salvation. Salvation. My stronghold, my high tower. When will we learn and keep remembering, keep remembering that our greatest life, our greatest comfort, our greatest strength, our greatest pleasure, our greatest peace, our greatest joy, our greatest love is in deliberate searching and seeking the Lord's presence by faith and obedience. Amen? Now we can show you an image of a strong tower, an image of a fortress. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, Proverbs 18.10. And the next screen has another tower. For you have been a shelter and a refuge for me, a strong tower against the adversary. And we have adversaries, Psalm 61, 3. And the next one, I can't read that. Would you read that, honey? The Lord God is the refuge and fortress. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day. Psalm 91, 1-5. Amen. Thank you. Psalm 91, 11 says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. As we are in intimacy with God, in obedience, God will use all his power and his angels to protect us when we listen to his voice and follow his commands. Amen? Now the story of Gideon and the fleece. 
I hope you remember the story of uh, Gideon. God sent an angel and told the angel to tell Gideon that he was going to use Gideon to deliver Israel from the suppression of the Midianite, Midianites. And Gideon was kind of a fearful guy. He was not courageous, but God was going to strengthen him it, it, as long as he surrendered to what God wanted him to do. So remember, he said, well, God, if this is true, you want me to deliver Israel, then make the fleece dry and the ground around it wet with dew. God did that. So then the next day, God, uh, Gideon says, well, uh, make the fleece wet and the ground around it dry. And God did that too. Then we pick up in Judges uh, uh, 7, 1 through 4. And this is the story of, of God using Gideon with 300 soldiers, 300 Israelite soldiers, to defeat a hundred over 100,000 Midianite soldiers. And we pick up in Judges 7, 1, it says, Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. So that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too what? Many. Thank you, church. Too many for, for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel claim, and then lest, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand saved me. So he says, now therefore pro proclaim in the hearing of the people saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, who doesn't want to fight, let them turn and what? Depart. depart. Thank you, Pastor. So, and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And out of the 32,000, 22,000 of them left. They said, we don't want to fight. 10,000 remain. So even after 22,000 leaving, God told Gideon that there was still too many. Too many soldiers. Judges 7, 5 says, But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will do what? Test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you. The same shall go with you. And of whoever I say to you, This one shall not go with you. The same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog, what? Laps. laps. Yes, thank you, Pastor Ray. You shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. So here's the test. If you take water from the lake and you lap it like a dog, like this, you set those people who are on the side. But if you're like... The other people, if you get down on your knees and you suck the water from the, from the lake with your mouth, with your face almost in the water, set those apart. In Judges 6, 6 through 8, and the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink the water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300. Now the camp of the Midian was below them in the valley. Now how many of you want to be the general of an army of 300 going against over 100,000 soldiers. Anybody raise your hand? <laughs> this is what Gideon, he was asking Gideon to do. Gideon's army is now down to 300 soldiers, but Gideon, but Gideon was still fearful, so God directed Gideon and took another opportunity to encourage Gideon further. In Judges 7, 9, it said, It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the what? The camp. In other words, he wants Gideon to go right down into the camp of the Midianites in the, in the cover of dark. They were like spies. They were, 
they were uh, uh, like spy agents. He says, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your what? Your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. So then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. That would even be scary to do, right? Two men going down to the camp of 100, over 100,000 Midianite soldiers. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as the sand by the seashore in multitude. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. One of the Midianite soldiers was telling another Midianite soldier his dream. He said, I have had a what? Dream. Thank you, Pastor Ray. A dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent did what? Collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, into his hand. God has delivered Midian and the whole Thank you, Brother, brother Fred, the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and this interpretation, he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Gideon bowed down and humbly worshipped God for God's communication with him and the deliverance of Israel through him. Amen? <laughs> Excuse me. Remember, Gideon was a fearful man. He did not have confidence in his abilities. But after his request of God to have dew on the sheep's fleece, but, on the, but not on the grass, and then to have dew on the grass, but not on the fleece, Gideon began to trust the Lord, especially when he heard the dream the Midianite soldier related to a fellow soldier. So this tells us that even the wicked, even the lost, are under God's power. He can guide and direct them to think the way he wants them to think for his purpose, even though they may reject him. Isn't that awesome? You, we don't have to fear wicked people. We don't have to fear unbelievers because God can direct their thoughts and their minds anyway. So Gideon told his troops to get ready to overpower the Midianites for Yahweh God was delivering the Midianites into the hands of Gideon's army of only 300 soldiers against over 100,000 Midianites and Amalekites. Judges 7, 16 says, Then he divided the 300 men into three companies, three groups, and he put a what? A trumpet into every man's hand and, and empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. He says, watch what I'm doing, and then you do the same. When I come to the edge of the clamp, you shall do as I do. Thank you, Pastor Ray. When I blow the trumpet, and I who are all with me will blow the trumpets as well, then you also blow your trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So, this is what their instructions were. So, in Judges 7, 19, it was just after midnight, after the changing of the, thank you, Stacy, guard. When Gideon and a hundred men with them reached the edge of the Midianite camp, suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke the clay jars, exposing the light of the torches. Then all the three groups blew their horns and broke their jars, they held the blazing torches in their left hand and the horns in their right hand, and they all shouted, A sword of the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position. They didn't go into the camp. They just stood there and watched as all the Midianites rushed around 
in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the Israelites blew their horn, their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to the places as far away as Beth Sheeta near Zerah and to the border of Abel Meheloha near Tabith. So the sword of the Lord delivered all the Midianites into Gideon's hand without the Israelites attacking the Midianites. Just as Gideon was armed with the sword of the Lord, we are to put God's armor on and equip and with the equipping of the sword of the Lord as well. In Ephesians 6:10 it says, "Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And guess what? The devil is always attacking us. He's always wanting to steer us away from doing what God says to do, to make bad choices day in and day out, multiple times a day. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, thank you, Pastor Ray, darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So as Christians, we are in a battle with the evil forces of this world, just as Gideon battled the Midianites. Gideon's battle was with the suppression of the Midianites and the Amalekites, and our suppression is the sin, the world, and spiritual forces in high places. We are always being attacked. So do not be dismayed because the devil is going to attack us every opportunity he gets. But remember, God works these attacks for our good. God will show us more of his love and his good towards us. Ephesians 6.14 says, Stand therefore, girded your waist with what? The truth. The truth of God's word. We must know and be in God's word constantly lest we be deceived by Satan because he's always attacking. And putting on the breastplate of righteousness, not our righteousness, but God's righteousness, Jesus' righteousness. And then have your, having shod your, your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, we should always be ready and willing to share the gospel with someone every day, every day. And sometimes I wonder, Lord, if we haven't shared the gospel with someone every day, was that a wasted day? Please, dear God, give us an opportunity to share the gospel with someone every day. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all, there's that shield, the shield of faith. We don't have a metal shield, we have a shield of faith. We don't have a buckler, we have a buckler of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then take the helmet of salvation, protecting our minds with the gospel and the truth of God's word, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, if you, if you look there, you see both letters S and W capitalized, because it's the sword of the spirit, and it's the word of the spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of the Spirit. Amen? So, if we are putting on God's armor, we are fighting a... If we aren't putting on God's armor, we are fighting a spiritual battle with the wrong equipment. And we are probably fighting the wrong battles altogether. Our battle is against the lies of this world the lies of the flesh, the lies of Satan. In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God, the sword of the Lord, 
is living and active and full of what? Power. Just like the power that Gideon had to defeat the Midianites, he, God, has given us that same power to defeat our addictions, our sin, uh, the, the, the lies of the world, the lies of Satan. It's full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging, and here it is, the very thoughts and what? Intentions of the heart. Now, we may see people that seemingly on the outside are very good people. But God knows the intentions of those people's hearts. And most of the time, not all the time, a lot of the time, those intentions are self-motivated. They're self-righteousness. They're not really for, for the good of the good that they're doing. It's for selfishness, for selfish reasons, unless they are being done in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit for His glory, for God's glory. So people may be nice to you on the outside, but inside they, they may be, have false motives and false intentions. It goes on to say, And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed and revealed to the eyes of him with whom we have to give an account. We will give an account of not only our behavior, but the intentions and motives of our behavior. Was the intentions and motives of our behavior only to, to make people think that we are good and self-righteous, and, and, or was it to glorify God? So we will give an account as to what our motives were. Not only what we did, but what the motives and the intentions are. So in the next image, God looks not only at what we do, but he looks at the motives and intentions of our heart. The sword, the word of God, is piercing and dividing between soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So it's not a matter of just doing good. It's a matter of, are your motives right? Are your motives in the power of the Holy Spirit of God? Amen? Which is different. Internet family and friends, I pray that your motives, I pray your intentions are to glorify God and to bring about His goodness, His joy, His peace, his righteousness for the benefit of those that are around you. In summary, any wrong thinking which goes against God's commands or his will and his ways are what we battle in ourselves every day. We make choices every day to glorify God or to feed our flesh. The forces of evil of the evil thinking of this world and then Satan's plot to overtake the world through globalization so that he can falsely claim he is God are all the things we are battling against. It's a spiritual warfare. You may not think you're in the, in the, in the battle, but you're right in the middle of it. And this is why we must be armed with God and his armor. This is why Yahweh God must be our buckler our shield, our strong tower, our fortress, our sword, the word, Yahweh God, is, is Yahweh God, all this to you and for you. Internet family and friends, I pray that God is your buckler, your shield, your strong tower, your fortress, the sword and the word in your life. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, thanking you and praising you, dear God for the magnificence, the power that you have given us over evil and darkness, 
the evil and darkness of the world, the evil and darkness over Satan, and even the evil and darkness of our own selfish flesh. Help us, Lord, to deny our flesh, to take up our cross. Deny our flesh. A lot of our problems can be completely and totally eradicated by denying our flesh. Taking up our cross. Not seeking our ambition or our status or our goals, but seeking God's will and following Christ. I pray, Internet family and friends, I pray, Emmanuel Church, that we will all surrender and be yielded to the Lord, that he is our shield, our buckler, our strong tower, our fortress, our sword, that we may walk in the power and strength of who he is in total righteousness. Because we pray this and ask this in the powerful name, the righteous name, the forgiving name, the holy name, the glorious name, whose church, I mean, whose name, church? Jesus. Internet family friends, whose name? In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. May, the, may you be yielded and surrendered to God's word. Amen. Thank you for spending time with us today. But remember, please spend time in the presence of the Lord God, being intimate with Him, praying, reading His Word, and applying His Word to your lives. Because in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. And let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he knows and understands me, Yahweh God. Because he is the Lord, he exercises loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these he delights in, says the Lord. Let us adopt these principles daily in our lives, that the Lord's grace may always be upon you and me. God bless you, and may you be completely enthralled in the love of God that he has for you.